So you should be able to see it now. Right. Okay. All right. So five, um, six, one is the first one that we worked with, and it's angle measure. Um, the first part of it was um, feeling the, you know, the things I sent out. The first one was converting from radians to degrees and degrees back to radians. Remember right yeah. that, right? I do. So let's let's do one or two examples of um, the ones that he gave us. Okay. Um, let me pull one up real fast. All right, so first one he gave us was um, converting 45 degrees. And I don't know if you can see. I'm going to click it over. I put, I put the whiteboard screen on, on my big picture so I can Perfect. see pretty well. Yeah, that's yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Right, so 45 degrees is equal to you know what in radians. And the formula... Um, that they provided for us was you know, keeping in mind that a circle was 360 degrees. It was also 2 pi, right? So you know we've got a one, 2 pi over 180 or 180 over 2 pi, whichever way we're going. Um, so in this case, because we want degrees on the bottom, it would be 45 times 2 pi over 180, or over 360, rather, which is the same as 1 pi. Oops. There you go. I guess it doesn't make any sense like that, right? No, no. It's it's either two pi over three sixty or one over eight. One, right, one, right, one, right. One eighty. So it's, so, uh, so we end up this this end up ends up coming out to pi over four. Yeah. So now that one's pretty straightforward. And I think the the other one from radians um, he gave us was. So I want to find some example. Uh, convert pi over three to yeah pi over three to degrees. So pi over three. Radians equals, and of course, in this case, we do the exact opposite. You know, we put the pi over three, and that would be times uh, pi here and 180 here. The pi's cancel. We're left with what is it, 45 degrees or something like that? So uh, 60. Yeah, 60 degrees. Right. right. Right, so that, that part was pretty straightforward. I just wanted to make sure that we had that before we went too far. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. What about uh, coterminal angles? You know, we, had, we had some vocabulary that he gave us in the very beginning dealing with the angles. So you know, here we have, you know, if we're, we're assuming that it's, it's going this direction, we have this part right here, which is, do you remember that part, what that line was called? Oh, that's the... Uh, oh, man. It's called the terminal side. It is the terminal side, and it's the hypotenuse of the triangle, yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. Right, and then we've also got the um, the underside of it, which is um, the initial side. Is that right underneath of the, all of the converting from pi to radians? One more time. Say it one more time. I'm trying to follow along in my notes. Or was that under the? Was that right after the converting from uh, degrees to radians, and radians degrees? It was. It was actually. Um, oh, here we he go. Discussed, I'm with you. Well, he discussed it on two separate days. He briefly hit it on the 19th, but then when we started talking about um, when we got into the arc length stuff, was when he really started talking about it. I think. Right, six dot one. When he got into it on um, August 20th. Um, about uh, midway through after doing a few examples and some other stuff, he came back to it. And at this point, we were talking about finding coterminal angles. Yep. yep. I'm, I'm with that's you. When he, that's when he brought it back up again. I found, I found where we are. And the other piece of vocabulary is if this was our unit circle, that point right there um, is called the terminal point. Right. Good. Yep. All right. So the next, um, the next thing we talked about um, on that first day was um, dealing with um, measuring of angles. You know, we we've got radians, we've got degrees, and what the uh, the definition of a radian actually is. Um, and the reason behind doing that is because we talked about finding. You know, this is the side of the circle. Finding this length, this sector length for any angle of theta.
All right, so if um, if this is our arc here, then it says that S is equal to the radius, when this is the radius, times theta, and of course theta is in radians. Right. Right. So let's let work a couple of those examples really fast. Sure. All right, so one that um, he listed was we have a... Well, let's do one that's not in like that. Yeah, let's do one in. Okay. Um, trying to find one that we need to convert. Oh, it's. I mean, I'm I'm good with all that. If you want to just skip past it. it. Yeah, this was a pretty. This is a really straightforward formula. Um, okay, perfect. All right, so I use this in physics some too. So. Oh yeah, great. Okay, so the next one is um, likewise. We've got the same guy here is finding the area for this section mm -hmm. inside of here, right? And that formula was one half of this sector length um, times r. One half length times r. Is that what it was? Uh, the, uh, one one half r squared. Theta. Square. Yeah, squared. All right, so which that's that's pretty straightforward. Then the only thing that uh, we have to worry about is uh, finding the sector length, and of course we know that that is this up here, right? Which you can't see. So as long as we've got those, and we've got the conversion for this into radians, then then that part is fine. Um. The big thing I think out of the 6.1 section was the the angular speed and the linear speed. I think that's where our application problems are going to come into play. This was all nothing more than than foundation to get us to that point. And um, some of the um, I don't know if you've got those formulas handy, but they were uh, see our angular speed was in terms of omega, right? Well, omega equals theta over time, so that gives us how many, how fast this part in radians went. The um, linear speed, on the other hand, was equal to um, the sector length over time, or it was also equal to um, the radius times um, the angular speed. <laughs> Right, I've got a, um, here, let's see, well, um, all right, so in the textbook, can you have your textbook with you? No, no, I can get on uh, Blackboard. Oh, okay, no, I, I'll just share it with this real fast, hold on. So, textbook, um, page 442 is here, hold on a second. Oh, that was Abney saying she's going to join us soon as she could. All right. Um, I'm already logged into Blackboard. I'll have it up in two seconds. Oh, okay. That's even better. That's even better. All right. So page 442 is the um, is the page that um, this problem was from, and it's problem number 4279A. And B. Are right, you there? Uh, almost. I just pulled the book up. Okay, that's fine. Uh, page four forty. 442, 442. Okay. And it's um, problem 79A and B. That was the ceiling fan problem. All right. All right. So he told us that we had a um, you know, ceiling fan in the middle of the room um, with 16 inch blades. So these blades are 16 inches. And. It rotates at 45 rotations per minute. So for every one minute, it goes around 45 times. 
So we had to convert that in order to get the answer. It wanted it in radians per minute. Um, to get the angular speed, we had to convert it um, into revolutions, right? Right. So, so we have 45 um, revolutions per minute. Um, that's equal, or multiply that times um, 2 pi for every one rotation. Which you can't really see that. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I think we were uh, 90 pi there. Right. 90 pi right. per radius. Yeah. Um, so if we know that that's what our rotations per minute are, that's we can then use the v equals radius times omega, and we substitute in. 16 times, and this right here is our, our omega, so 16 times 90 pi. What is it? That's actually radians now, but 16 inches times 90 pi. And it works itself out to 1,440 pi per minute. Right. Um, I don't know. Did we do eight? That's for the that's the linear speed, right? That's no, no, that's, that's that's angular speed. Right. Well, this right here, this is linear speed, and this is angular speed. Okay. Right. This this is our omega value. Okay. And our, our linear speed is, is based off of that value, right? Okay. All right. What's the next step? Do we want to do any more linear angular speed stuff? Can you move on? Do we want to do one or two more? Well, well, we can. We can. It was. I remember this stuff being pretty straightforward. I just need to pay attention to... Um, because all the, there are like three different equations that all kind of interrelate there. I just need to make sure that I'm paying attention to what, you know, which what each of them are, which one I'm using. Um, and I, for me, a good way to do that is to instead of using the, the the shorthand for something, writing out the full equation for each part, and that way I can make sure I'm using the right, right. units, or you know what I mean. So, that's you know, one of the things I've I've always found easy, and I don't know if you're a, a visual person or not. I always find it easier to draw the picture out. You know what I mean? Right, right. If I can, if I can look at it, then I can probably figure out how to put the pieces together. Right, right. All right. The next section was um, okay. It was actually in section five point one, dealing with the unit circle. And I like your chart in the back of your room, by the way. Yeah, it's I'm not, terrible with the unit circle, man. Terrible. Well, one of the things that he skipped um, along the way in, in teaching this to us was um, reference numbers. He didn't, he didn't make reference to reference numbers, I think, possibly. And if he did, maybe I missed it. I, I just didn't see that part. But um, it, that yeah, actually... I, I honestly, the, the video didn't do a ton for me. Um, mm -hmm. I would have enjoyed a class session on that. And um, that part seemed to go pretty quickly, but didn't seem to be overly straightforward. Um, so, hang on, hang on one second. Sure, sure, sure. No, that's fine. What are you doing, Mike? I don't know. You're using inside voice. What are you trying to do? Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for that guy. Oh, okay. So, try to be quiet, okay? Okay, I'm back with you. Sorry, sorry. Do you, do you remember how to fill out the um, how to fill out the unit circle? So I'm, I mean I don't even really necessarily get where the like the cube root or the square root of three over two, the square root of two over two, where all that comes from. Okay. The, I guess the x value, if you will. Right. So as, the way that I remember, as long as I know this part right here, 
which is where your reference values are. Your reference numbers are always in this section here. As long as I know this part right here, I can figure everything else out. Okay. So, so we know that, that the radius is, is 1 on this thing. So this value right here is going to be 1, 0. And we know that right. this is going to be 0, 1. I mean, that's given. Right? Absolutely. And so the, the way the numbers work is there's only um, a couple more values that you really have to know. Um, everything, remember he told us everything was divided by 2. So if you put everything over there, so. And then you start working your way up. The outside number is going to go to the work and take the home. Did that get rid of some of the, uh, some of the feedback? Uh, it, it was only for a brief second there. Yeah, I don't know what it was that happened. Okay, so in order to do this whiteboard, I'm actually running two computers in my house. I've got one mounted to a, um, um, it, it's, it's actually an old lampstand that has a uh, flexible arm, and I've got a camera mounted to it so that it's coming right down here on the piece of paper. Okay. And then I've got the other one actually on the computer in front of me. Yeah. So uh, I'm running two cameras at the same time. I got to keep one muted, otherwise we get the sound off the speakers. That's that's annoying. But okay. anyway, so each one of these have um, divided by two. The way it works is you work. See, if this is a zero on the outside, so you know that because it's zero, your next number up is going to be one, and you take the square root of each of the numbers as you count. So the square root of one is one. Okay. The square root of two is the square root of two. The square root of three is the square root of three. And this is zero, so you're going to count back, count around the other way this time. So zero. The square root of one is one. The square root of two is two. The square root of two, rather. The square root of three is the square root of three. And if you can't go in, the square root of four is four. And then four divided by two is one. That's how we get the one there. So as long as you know those values there, you can fill the others in because all you do is fold it across the axis. You know, you're just flipping these around. So this right here would come over here. It would just be negative one half square root of three, right. three root of two, and negative square root of two over two, square root of two over two. So it just depends on which quadrant it is as to how you apply the sign. And likewise, you do the exact same thing when you flip it over the um, the x axis to get the bottom ones. It's those exact same values all the way around. So all those numbers. Okay. Okay. I see that. Does that make sense? Sure. All those numbers. It's it's that same set of. of it's the exact same. Points. If you can build this you first one right to their their negative or positive positive position on the on the x axis or on the graph or whatever. Right. Well, actually, yeah, because you got you have to treat the x and the y axis like like a place where you fold the paper. So if you were to right. fold the paper and it would blotch across, that's how the numbers would transfer. No, and likewise, the other way around. Easy enough. And then, how about the the pi relationship on the inside? The pi relationship. Okay. So if you think about um, zero is zero, right? And all the way across to the other side is pi. Right? And the middle okay. is pi over two. And then you just you just break each part. The 30, 60, 90 are in thirds, so they're gonna be pi over six. Then the next one, um, the next third up is pop um, three pi over six. Right? Um, uh, well I in in the part that you're using I've just got pi over three written on my board. Here, let me pull it up. So, pull up. I'll open up my lab manual and pull out that unit circle. Yeah, they have pi, is three, pi over 3 as well. Right, which is the same as 2 pi over 6, right? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so that's, so that's how that works. You just, you just number them as you go around. Okay. They're broken out that way. The one in the middle, of course, is going to be um, in fourths, right? Because right. if this is pi over two, then that's right down the middle of that. That's pi over four. Right. So that's a separate section. That works its way around. 
until you finally get the two pi. Okay. Okay. That all makes sense. So one of the things that um, knowing this reference number, you can actually figure out um, all these other values. Um, it was it was a section that uh, let's see if I can find the page. It was in um, finding terminal oh. points. It was actually in the very beginning of section 5.1. There's a, um, on the left hand side, you click on unit circle 5.1, and let's see, it's actually in terminal points it's on page 371. It's terminal points. Wait a minute. No. Actually, no, this is in a little further on. It's reference number. It's on page 373. So that's where it starts talking about reference numbers, and it, it talks more specifically about um, finding the reference number T. T is the closest you can get to the x-axis in a positive in quadrant one. And so your values are always going to be positive for your reference numbers. This reference number here they're talking about, it's always going to be positive, and it's going to be... Um, mirrored values of whatever the quadrant is. So the only difference between where your point is on the circle and that is sine. And that may not make any sense until we actually work one. Let's look at page... Um, okay, so if you look at page 374, and we can, we can do one or two of those. So if we start with... Um, let's, do, let's do problem... Well, they're all actually worked out but we'll actually work through how they got them. So if you take problem A, which is um, find if T equals 5 pi over 6, they want to know what the um, reference point is equal to, right? Right. So okay. you start off with your circle, right? 3 pi over 6 is here, right? That's, ha that's, that's pi over 2. 6 pi over 6 is going to be here, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so you remember okay, our so number... You can just step back one one place from there. Right, right remember our, our points kind of look like this, right? So from here, if you step back one six, that puts us there. So if we counted those out, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6... Wait a minute. One, two, three, four. Is that right? Six. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. All right. So this is three, six, four, six, five, six. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So five, six is there. Um, so that being said, what would the um, the point be on this one? So because we're in this quadrant, we would actually we would actually fold it across this line right here. And so if you folded it across, it would be this point here. Right? Yep. So mathematically, to get from this point to this point, you, you would subtract it from this line, which is pi. All right? So you've got 5 pi over 6. It's almost 1. So pi minus that would equal pi over 6, which is this point here. So if we look up here again, and our pi over 6 values are these, then we know that point is going to be at square root of 3 over 2 comma 1 half. Because it's in the second quadrant, we know that x is negative, so that's going to make this negative, and y is positive, so that's positive. So that would be our point, the terminal point right there. Make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. So as long as you know this and you can determine that that um, that reference value, you can determine what that actual point is. You want to do another one? Um, sure, that's easy to. Okay, let's do one more. We'll do, um, let's see, we'll do number, letter C, what was that? Uh, t negative 2 pi over 3. Okay. So negative 2 pi over 3.
Is that what you came up with? Uh, not as quickly. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. So, so here's what I did. I'm on the right track as you. So that's, I mean, that's good. So yeah. here's here's what I did as far as the logic went. I said, okay, I knew it was negative two thirds. What do I do to get it back into the positive between zero and pi over two? Well, I can add pi to it because if I add pi to it, that's going to put me right across here. Right? Right. Okay, so um, I'm one third pi or pi over three off from here. If I flip it, that angle is going to be the same, right? Because opposite angles are the same. So then we know this is also going to be pi over three. So that gets me into the, the right angle up there. So by adding pi over three, only three pi over three, which is a pi, I end up with pi over three. And then I went back to my chart up here. And pi over 3 told me my values were 1 half and square root of 3 over 2. Right. So I write those values down. And I look at what, what quadrant we're in, so I know both parts are negative, and so I put a negative sign in front of each. Okay. Yeah, that's it's really, it's actually pretty straightforward. Yeah. Very straightforward. I, 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 I was, that's the part that I was missing when he was doing the instruction, and, and maybe, like I said, maybe I... I Turn my head or something like that. No, that I didn't either. And, and you know, I went into the homework and I looked at it and I I, I felt like I was missing something um, because it, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to. That should be to me probably a, a quicker homework that we do going through the unit circle stuff. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And but I was just I wasn't necessarily following the way the. I mean, there's a clear and obvious order to everything, but not necessarily how to use it. You know. Sure. 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 Do you think you'd be able to draw the circle now? Oh, I think I would. Yeah, it wouldn't be quick. It's something that I probably need to sit down and do, uh, you know, six or seven times from scratch just to make sure that I'm kind of in that mindset. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had in mind I had uh, laid out all the, ex you know, essentially the. What is it? The two pi, the pi over two, the pi and and then the three pi over two and was working my way around filling out right. uh, everything. So it was, I just need to be more efficient at it is, is I think the biggest thing. Yeah. One of the things um, I'm sure I'll end up doing when we go to start our test is to draw that, that quadrant one out and put those values out there so that I've got it as a reference because you know, it's going to be on there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's see what else was there. Um, other than that, there was finding terminal points for large values of t, where t is our radians, you know, where we've got these multiple loops. And, and you know that in that case, you just you keep subtracting out 2 pi until you get it down to something less than 2 pi. And right. then it goes back to exactly what we just did. Right. All right, that, that finishes up. Um, Section six one and five one. So all that's all that we're down to now is six two, which is um, that was trig ratios and applications with trig ratios. All right. So we pull six two up. So is there? Bear with me as I run the page. Is there um, any part of? The trig ratios themselves that um, you have challenges with? No, um, no. I I just got out of uh, the physics algebra-based physics, so we did okay. we use trig for all kinds of stuff. So I mean the order of where they go and that kind of stuff is really I'm good with that. Alrighty, let's. Um, you want to do um, one or two warm-up guys just to um, to fill it in. Sure, I don't. I struggle with. I, I don't struggle with, but I don't think about secant, cosecant, and we in physics we called everything inverse. It was just inverse, you know. Right. So, um, the terminology is it's different. Not as fresh to me, but I just write them down in the same order every time, and I know that they're the inverse, so it's not a big deal. Right, but um, but um, you remember in, in mathematics, the inverse is um, something that you can plug in to get back that initial value. Right. So, um, yeah. So. Um, it would kind of be different, I guess, different wording. Um, so one of the things that um, we're presented with is um, given, uh, where's it at? Okay, so given a specific um, statement, for example, um, cosine of theta 
equals three fourths find sine tangent cotangent secant oops and cosecant of theta for each of those. And I don't know how you work, but I always work better by drawing it, drawing it out just to see it. It works for me. So cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse and 3 squared, 5 squared, 25, 4. So we know it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. That's not either. That's wrong. Yeah, I totally did that wrong. So cosine is three, and this is four. So it would be square root of twelve, right? No, three nine. 16 minus 9 square root of 5. Okay. So sine would be square root of 5 or 4. Tangent would be square root of 5. Three. I, you know, just like you were talking about with the unit circle, I, even though I remember the Sokotoma thing, I always write that down just to make sure that I'm always putting it in the right order. Um, oh, sure. It's an easy thing to just look at and, you know, it takes the guesswork out of it if there was any. Right. I think any any kind of notes that you can give, even if you know it, it's all. I think it's always good to put down those kind of reinforcements, you know. You take the uh, the turning something from a, a graph into a function or a function back into the graph that we were doing uh, last week in class. I write down that function every problem. It's not just once on the page, but I write it with every problem. And I write the variable names down to figure them all out as we go. Right. Um, if I if I didn't do that, it, 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 I'd miss something. You know. Absolutely. I, all right. Let's see. Um, with that, here? I just need to pay attention to factoring on that. I need to always make sure that I'm pulling out. You know, oh, it's, sure, sure. It's easy to just, I, I have paid attention to it because I've messed up enough in the past, um, but it's always one of those things to, first thing you should consider. And then go right. right here. Let's see, we've got, um, the next would be trig problems. So, at the bottom of, we can. You want to work a couple of problems in the book for sure. these trig problems. All right. So one of them says we have a. It's on the bottom of page 446. It says we have a, a giant redwood tree, right? That um, casting a shadow 532 feet long. Um, the angle of elevation to the sun is 27.5 degrees, or 25.7 degrees, I'm sorry. So the question is, how tall is the tree? We've got the adjacent angle. Mm -hmm. Sorry, with the adjacent length and the angle. So we can really use any of the. 
Well, let's, let's think about the tools now. So if you think about it, we're looking at the opposite of the other tangent. Mm -hmm. Still a tall tree. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the actual value is, but but the height is referenced as 532 times the tangent of 25.7. That's all that I think. That's all that we really need to do after that. It's calculator. Yeah, no, it's uh, 256, 256 feet. Is it? Yeah. That is big. I think that's a football field tall. What do you use the uh, 84 or the 89? I use the 89. What do you have? 89. Are you yeah, familiar with the, with the solve feature that's in there? Uh, what feature is that? Solve. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am. Okay. I, did, I knew nothing about it until the end of our course last term. Uh, it's a great double check, you know, and it's... For, sometimes I use it if I'm just not sure about the, you know, if I want to make sure that I get the order of operations right. It's much easier for me to plug that in than it is to, you know, why risk the, the human error when you have modern day technology? So. Yeah, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's see what's the next one we've got in here. Um... Oh, so we're certainly going to have one of these similar to the bottom of page 447, where we have um, two different things to compare to take the difference between or the increase. I think the one that we uh, we did in um, class or maybe it's an assignment was, you know, we have a, a mountain and then you drive a thousand feet closer, the angle sure. changes from this to yeah. this, what's the height? So. And that's nothing different than you know, that as far as figuring it out goes. It's two separate problems and subtracting the uh, the difference between them. Right. No, that was that was pretty straightforward to me. This stuff is like this. It's different than the physics, but it's. I mean, this is very much how we use trig in physics. So, you know, finding links of different, you know, and then layering multiple triangles on top of each other to find out how different collisions happened or whatever. But. Sure, this is pretty straightforward. Which uh, which physics are you in right now? I'm not. I did 151 last semester. Um, I think I'm probably going to do 152 next semester. I'm impressed. Um, a lot of times they they suggest that you have your at least your first year of calculus in before you even start the physics. They because it's algebra based. They um, they just require that you do 171. Oh really? Oh, this is this isn't the uh, two fifty one, two fifty two. It's one. No, no, no. The I mean, I I took brief calculus, which isn't calculus one. It's I guess the the guts of it. Um, right. I, I, I mean, I could see how it sh really should probably just be a requirement for for you to have calculus to do it. It's much easier, but um, it's good to be exposed. I mean, I like the logic of, of physics. It was great to. You know, I think it's good for everyone to be exposed to really thinking about how things move and work. You know. Sure. Is that what is that what you're planning on doing with all this? Environmental science for me. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it'll actually be much more chemistry than than this stuff. How about you? Yeah, I write software for a living, so that's what it's eventually going to be. Okay. The, the company I work for suggested that I I push forward and do this. It's been over 20 years since I did this the first time, but I didn't finish it, so nothing transferred. Right. So I have to start all over again, which that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is to eventually get into the um, the teaching side of it. So when okay. I get you know, old and gray, I'm not the Walmart reader. I'm the the guy that's pushing their grandchildren through school. Sure. So what what uh, are you going to go for? Like your computer science? Um, actually, believe it or not, I think I'm going to steer towards math and potentially physics. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I I love math. I really do. So, no, it's my wife actually got her undergrad in uh, in math from NC State. Um, oh, really? And then went into their uh, advanced analytics program and got her master's in advanced analytics. So she gets to use math and computers. That's you know the fun stuff, SAS, right? SAS programming and it's she actually um, have you seen Moneyball? Are you familiar with that movie? Uh, uh, no. Um, 
I think it was Brad Pitt that was in it, where the it was the Oakland A's and they used statistics to um, make the best of their budget, essentially. Um, right. She worked for the Houston Astros for about a year doing that. Um, really? Using, using statistics to try to maximize their amateur drafts and try to build up their farm team because they just they got bought out two years ago. They changed owners and the owners took the brought the GM from the um, Cardinals in along with his kind of science guy, computer guy, um, and they set up a they've got a small like four team department that just focuses on making the best choices. It's crazy. It's actually really amazing, all the different things they look at. But. That is too cool. That is too cool. Well, I think that's, I think that's everything that, um, that I wanted us to get through today. Okay. Um, is there anything that you wanted to work through before um, class tomorrow? No, I'm probably going to just uh, plug away on homework here. I'm going to hit that unit server a few times and try to make some headway on homework. I've got a chemistry test on Friday. So oh, nice. this is going to be a tough. Um, it's going to be a tough week. I need to get my. I've got a couple of online classes as well, so sure. probably going to just try to bounce around between getting homework done and reinforcing these, and then getting my online class stuff out of the way so I can really stay focused on on this and, and the chemistry class. You know, I, I took uh, took online courses across the summer, and I found that they actually require more attention to the course than taking the course in the classroom does. It's a lot of work. And it's, it's in some ways, you know, I take them for the flexibility of schedule because um, I'm a full-time student. I work. I, I have my son when I'm not doing one of those things. Sure. Um, you know, and my, my mom helps us out with, with daycare and the, when I'm going to class. But it's kind of nonstop. And so... Um, I really appreciate the teachers that allow us to submit things once a week because that's that's what I need. It's sure. and I've got some, I've, one of my classes. It's like three three posts a week that you have to do, and it's tough to to find the time that you know I want to focus on <laughs> one thing at a time. And um, so it's been it's been it's always interesting to get adjusted to the new semesters. Well, listen. Um, what my plans for this um, was was to be down the line. Obviously, this is just cramming, getting ready for the test. But um, what I was wanting to do with this is set aside you know one or two days a week to open it up. You know, not obviously show up for both of them if you don't have to, if you don't want to. But if anything, just for us all to get together and work through our homework together, so that you know we can work through problem by problem. You know, our my numbers may be different from yours, but the problem setup will be the same. Right. And so that way, you know, we've at least got a peer group to work through or to go over whatever material it was that we've got going on, and then obviously to prep for these tests. I figure, you know, as much support as we can get with each other, the better, you know? No, that's, I've, I've done really well in, uh, in my math and science classes, mostly from um, study groups, honestly. It's not anything else. Uh, I think it's a great recommendation to do, uh, to work through homework as we go mm -hmm. along. Um, I, I think if if the numbers stayed down and it was around, I think you said the max is eight, but four to five, maybe we could uh, rotate on our thought process so that oh, everyone gets the, the benefit of, of explaining. And, um, oh, no, 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 absolutely. You know, that's absolutely. A, In um, fact, that being said, if you'd like to take the next section to explain, it's all yours. No, I'm actually struggling to, to pick up on some of this stuff right now. Um, okay. It's been, I've had a lot of, of personal life things going on that, not bad, just lots of extra unexpected things that I've had to deal with that have taken a lot of time away from from this. So I'm I've been I'm feeling under pressure to get to get kind of caught up to where I'd like to be anyways, but <laughs> in, time, in time. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right. Well I'm gonna I'm planning on I'm planning on doing um, two sessions on Monday. I don't know what your schedule is on Monday. Um, I was wanting to do one around like the five o'clock hour and one around like the seven o'clock hour. Okay. So if you can I join us, do both of those. All right. So um, the goal on that is to get through everything else that we've done in the semester, um, graphing the um, the functions, um, doing modeling har um, harmonic motion, which was mm -hmm. one we only touched on the like two springs, and and I think we did the um, oh the the harbor right, and then yeah. we've also got um, um, taking. Um, Taking graphs and turning them back into functions. So that's that's the big thing. I, you I'll know, honestly, that. I think if you can do one, you should be able to do the other. As far as oh, the graphing functions and all that. If that's a, 
I, it, for me, it's more about, um, and, and I need to do what, what you said you've been doing in, in writing out that equation every time, um, that just that I'll, I'll mix up the, the order or, or what exactly is going on. And, um, but it, it really, you know, once you do one, if you can't get one out of the other, then right. bigger fish to fry. You know? You know, one, thing, one thing that I did find really quick, and, and then we'll drop off here, that is the easiest thing to do is, um, let's say we have like two times the sine of um, 3 pi x minus, I don't know, 2 uh, plus 4. If we had something something like this, let me flip back down to it. Uh, one thing that I did find that was the easiest thing for me to do is I draw my line first, and that's the only thing I draw, which is the x line. And then I write the equation out. You know, you, you've got the a sine k um, x minus b plus c. So I write that out, and I know I've got to get this right here into that format. I know that k is equal to um, the period. I mean, k is equal to the uh, 2 pi. 2 over, pi over the period. Right. So, but I want to get this out of there so that I've got that k value, right? Right. Like, that'll give me my period. So if I can, if I can grab, or I can get the period out of them. Sorry. So you bring that three pi out, and you divide this side also by three pi, and we end up with. Yeah, that was gonna be a little difficult. Maybe I should have made this like one half pi or something like that to make it a little easier to work with <laughs> <laughs> to get that out of there. So. That brings the uh, by three pi gives us three pi at the top, so it'd be three halves. So we end up with a is equal to two, um, b is equal to three halves, and then a is equal to two. So a is equal to two, b is equal to three halves, because we draw that line where that minus sign is, and whatever that value is is what it goes as. Um, a, B, C, C is 4. Yeah. Right, so if I know that K is equal to um, 3 pi, right, then the period is equal to 2 pi over 3 pi. 2 thirds. Right. So, as, so I start with that. I've got everything that I need right here. And I draw the line first. So I start with my B value, and I say, okay, three halves, right? My C value tells me where this, the um, line is going to be. I know it's a sign, right? So this is three halves, and the line is all the way back here. So three, four. The value that um, uh, plus the period. Right. Equals the last value, right? So two thirds. Okay, so that's that value. And of course, you know, you're not using it. You can know, figure those out. As long as I've got a this. <laughs> You've got everything needed. Right? Yep. Four, three, two. Yeah. Yep. So as long as I've got that, that's all that matters. Right. right. And you know, I think you've got a great method there because it is much more difficult to try to draw the line around the grid. Right. Than, exactly. You know, the, the origin or whatever. Um, and because these values can be whatever we want, you can you know his graph paper looks like this, right? So what I can do is do one, two, three, every four. So there, that gives me my four points or five points, I guess. You know, there's my five points. Now that I've got those, then I've got this. I can just draw a little sign right there, and I can just put the values on here, so what they are, and then draw the graph around it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, the problem that I've got is when you got the graphs, it's got you know the the origin right there in the middle of it. How, how do you work with that? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Just circle a different spot and say that's the origin. <laughs> that's right. Origins over here. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it's implied. That's all. Uh, I'm going to send you a link to a pretty cool video that I sent him. It's about a guy that um, makes kinetic sculptures, kinetic wave sculptures using a bunch of trig functions. Um, right. It's like a 10 minute video. You can kind of cruise through it or disregard or whatever you want to do. It's there, but it, it's pretty cool. Right. I think it's worth watching. So. Sounds great. Well, thanks for having right, me well, around five on Monday. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. I'll send you the link to the YouTube video if you want to pour through it down the line, okay? Okay, sure. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye.